Hello and welcome to the report, Cal State, Fuller Cal State Fullerton's premier source for news, views, and info. I'm Shaira Arias. I'm Evan Boydston. I'm Jessica Lucero. I'm Jeffrey Witten. And I'm Nicholas Garcia. On today's episode, we'll be discussing the Green New Deal and climate change legislation, as well as the state of post-convention politics. Also, we have the latest on a recent CSUF graduate who received a scholarship with her winning essay and a segment on the Endangered Alphabets exhibit showcased right here at the Polak Library. Furthermore, with Campus News, we have a story on exchange students that are joining Cal State Fullerton students and faculty this summer to help with research projects, as well as a story of a Cal State Fullerton assistant professor of health science who is leading several studies to better understand how food labeling affects college students' purchasing decisions. Also, we remember the incredible life of David Bald Eagle, who recently passed away at the age of 97. All this and more on another summer edition of The Report. Before we delve into our first hot topic, we'd like to invite you to be a part of the discussion this coming semester. Click on the link in the caption of any of our report episodes to fill out a secure Google form with your opinion on any controversial issue that we've talked about now or in the past. As many of these issues are recurring and evolving, ranging from gun control to abortion, climate change, or the state of politics right now, all we ask is to please keep it civil and as with any essay, cite your sources. Climate change has been making waves in the 2016 presidential election with Democratic, Independent, Green, and even Libertarian candidates on board with attempting to form some consensus on dealing with the ever-present effects of human-made climate change looming now and into the future. They all differ on approaches in tackling climate change, but they all agree with one thing. Climate change is real and here to stay for the foreseeable future. Beyond politics, scientists have agreed on the realities of climate change for decades as a compilation of almost a century's worth of research and thousands of years of easily discernible and verifiable data point to the main reason for climate change. Carbon dioxide, commonly known as CO2 and legally defined as a greenhouse gas in 2017 by the EPA, is a clear gas that traps more solar radiation as the worldwide concentrations continue to increase above pre-industrial levels. As of late June, we are reaching near 407 parts per million, up from 393 parts per million in 2012. Less than half a century ago, we were at about 320 parts per million, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. Not only are we increasing CO2 levels every year, we are increasing more rapidly in an exponential curve that could exceed 600 parts per million by 2050. This would equate to a doubling of global levels of CO2 since the Industrial Revolution. Thus, three important questions push the forefront of this discussion. One, are we past the point of no return? Two, how fast will the predicted changes occur? And three, what is the most viable solution for these mitigation efforts? I'd like to start off with a few points from my senior thesis that I did a few, master's degree thesis. I did it two years ago today. Sadly enough, none of the legislation I talked about in it has been updated and no current uh, currently there's no currently introduced legislation for cap and trade or even a carbon tax program. Um, but before we begin, I just want to start, you know, start the discussion with a couple points that I highlighted in my thesis. Um, talking about the Clean Air Act as a regulator of whatever carbon tax we come up with. The first is it would essentially change the Clean Air Act from a basic protector of public health governing air pollution by a highly susceptible public to a governance framework over potential changes to climate due to the now legally defined six greenhouse gases. Um, so that's kind of one thing to keep in mind. Um, so the first question is, are we past the point of no return? And uh, my next quote actually is a little deeper than that. The first point is, uh, to mention is we were on our way to the next ice age. This one quote from William Whitesell, who uh, had a great book that I used for a lot of my research, uh, his book called Climate Policy uh, Negotiations. 
He stated, quote, our own interglacial period began around 11 millennia ago. Natural forces might have initiated another ice age by now were it not for human activities. So let's go ahead and start discussion. Well, we are definitely past the point of no return. Um, the issue is continuing, and the only thing that can be done is going to be done through us. And even though, in a way, we wouldn't be making the changes on our own, it needs to be implemented through politics. And, you know, nobody's going to decide, oh, let me be more green. Let me worry about my climate. Let me worry about my environment, unless you're almost basically forced by the government. Certain changes were done within healthcare because you were practically forced to have health care. So mm -hmm. it's, it, that's the point of no return? Yes, it's here. I personally but now, don't think we're completely past the point of no return, but I think we're well on our way. And I think what would definitely help with that is if it turns not only into just a trend, but people actually start doing stuff to help it. We have people that are in the public eye that can start doing stuff to help it, and uh, they're just going out there and they're wearing like, the recycling sign on their shirt, and that's not going to help. Like you, you actually have to do something, you know. And I think that's what we're missing. Be a vocal advocate. Yeah, exactly. Essentially. Well, I mean, the problem is also that we have the Republican nominee who says that climate change is a hoax. When in reality, like there's so much data to prove that climate change is not a hoax, that it's here and it's here to stay. I think the problem is that they can pick and choose their data. Yeah, it was a cold day in somewhere where it's typically hot, and then they use that as to say, it's a hoax, you know, there's no way. So I think that's what another problem, and they, a lot of the political figures obviously are able to, or say that because a lot of times they're obviously bought out by certain companies. Mm -hmm. And Donald Trump also said it, it's weather, it goes up and it goes down, but that's not it. Like within the past how many years, the summers have increasingly gotten much warmer. It's about climate, not weather. Weather is day-to-day -day and very unpredictable. The general trend in climate is totally different. Overall, the temperature overall of Earth has been going up. And they're saying it's the two degrees Celsius increase that's going to be detrimental. Well, the problem is, the unfortunate thing is, we need, like you said, government to enforce some kind of regulations on our CO2 emissions. And that's not going to happen when we're stuck in such gridlock over is it real, is it not real? We're beyond the point, the scientists have all said. You know, we're beyond the point of is it real or is it not real, it's what can we do? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, until our politicians decide to agree that, yeah, this is an issue that we need to take care of. It's a global issue that we need to come together on. We're not gonna get anything done. You know, what's ironic is that I'm not native from here, from California, so when I came to California 10 years ago uh, for my first vacation during the summer, this time right now, um, I remember thinking, okay, California is hot and, and everything, but once it would hit around 3, 4, 5 o'clock and on, I needed to have a sweater, and I was complaining to my mom. I was like, I've been bamboozled. The weather's really cold in California <laughs> in the middle of July. And I remember it being, you know, Empire a little chilly. And mm -hmm. now, yes, at night. And now I walk out of my house at 9 o'clock at night, and I'm like, it's still, it's still hot here. Yeah, and this is 10 years later today in comparison to then. So... You know, I'm, I'm living it, and I mm -hmm. feel it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you're kind of the master at the climate change. You're kind of the one heading this. So what, how, how fast do you think it's going right now? Like, what's, what is the, and what do they mean by how fast is it going? It's basically the amount of emissions we're putting into the atmosphere. We're going upwards of two parts per million per year, mm -hmm. down from less than one part per million in the 80s and 90s. So we're increasing at an increasing rate. So it's essentially an exponential curve now. And uh, two years ago, you know, I said, uh, I had a few citations of scientists stating that 400 parts per million was the sort of tipping point, and we're already at 407. Oh, okay. um, but the current research that I've done was the doubling of pre-industrial levels will be the true tipping point. We started before the Industrial Revolution at around two, it was, of course, cycling for the seasons, 280 parts per million. So 600, between 580 and 600 is our doubling. So once we double, that's when things are going to start getting a little crazy. That's the current consensus anyways. Last year, an annual report released by ExxonMobil, the fifth largest oil and gas company in the world, states that, quote, 
society continues to face the dual challenge of expanding energy supplies to support economic growth and improving living standards while simultaneously addressing the societal and envi environmental risks posed by rising greenhouse gas emissions and climate change as we seek to increase production of oil and gas to meet growing global energy demand we continue to take steps to improve efficiency reduce emissions and contribute to effective long-term solutions to manage climate change risks carl schranberg chairman of british petroleum stated in the bp annual report 2015 has seen increased focus on climate change. BP has consistently argued for a price on carbon and recognized the part we all must play in being part of the solution. However, governments must take the lead in developing policies to reduce carbon emissions, and we continue to engage in this debate. With the largest oil producer in the United States and all of Europe on board with addressing climate change, the last piece of the puzzle is the obligation of the United States Congress to come to an agreement on comprehensive litigate legislation in order to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. This brings us to the realm and role of politics in the 2016 presidential election. Thank you, Jeffrey. And speaking of political gridlock, with the 2016 Republican and Democratic National Conventions in the books, it's easy to see both political events had their share of shining moments, as well as problems. Both of the conventions featured historically unpopular co candidates, with Trump at a 57.4 disapproval rating and Clinton at a 54.1, according to Real Clear Politics. Both of the nominees' families attempted to humanize the candidates with speeches that have been criticized and praised across the political spectrum. While Melania Trump had at first been praised for her speech at the first night of the RNC, it quickly came to light that at least one passage in her speech plagiarized Michelle Obama's speech to the Democratic National Convention in 2008. However, the DNC had their share of problems the first day as well, with Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the committee's, the committee's chairperson, stepping down following the release by WikiLeaks of a collection of emails indicating that Schultz and other members of the DNC staff showed bias against the presidential campaign of Senator Bernie Sanders in favor of Hillary Clinton's campaign. Overall, the DNC ratings prevailed over the RNC except during Donald Trump's speech, with, which had over 9 million viewers, according to Nielsen data, whereas Hillary Clinton only had approximately 3 million viewers. After analyzing each convention, what are your thoughts on the RNC and the well, DNC? Um, one thing that I did was, um, me and Jeff, we were, when we were doing research for this, we, I, what I did, I watched the live streams. I didn't want to watch it on any, any news channel because then you're going to have to hear the panelists, and a lot of them are typically in their one side. Negative talk on both ends. Exactly. So, but then after, after I would watch the uh, RNC and DNC, I would go, so after the RNC, I would watch CNN and see their highlights, and then the next week I would go home and um, for the DNC, and I would watch Fox News and their highlights to kind of see what they're bashing each other on. And it really put an interesting perspective on, because, I mean, obviously we know, we know, where typically those news those news sites where they where they stand on the political spectrum typically but um but it was just really interesting seeing both of the, bo both of the stuff that they had to say and they both found ways to say negative things of course you know being the opposing side but it, that was just something interesting that i just wanted to bring up i thought it was very unfortunate that once the entire situation that happened with uh, melania trump um there was just so much focus on that, that it just took so much away from what Donald Trump had to say, no matter what it was that he had to say. You want to hear it. He is the candidate. So it took a lot of focus from him. What are his plans? What are the things that he wants to implement? And it was just constantly talking about the plagiarizing and the plagiarizing. I, you know, among everyone that I, that I even spoke to about the convention, they, uh, that's all they spoke about, and it was very unfortunate. Because um, the whole point is like to have party unity and whatnot, and that mm -hmm. obviously affected a lot. Yeah. What I thought stood out was uh, the DNC se seemed very lighthearted compared to the RNC, and I think that was because of the glass ceiling that they spoke about mm -hmm. that Hillary Clinton broke through. And uh, I was talking to my dad about it, and he said he was getting emotional. And he's not an emotional guy, but he said he was emotional watching it because he never thought that he would see a woman candidate for president. And he said that it was so cool seeing it finally happen. And I guess as a millennial, I sort of took it for granted. Like, I, I'm, a lot of us are very uh, 
all about equality. And so seeing that, I was kind of like, this is awesome. But my dad really understood how significant it all was. And I think that's what stood out at the DNC. Well, I think that Michelle Obama really captured that in the first night in her speech when she said, you know, our children, because of Hillary Clinton, our children will take for granted that a woman can be president. I think that that speaks to it, you know, in volumes. Yeah. We, we do take it for granted. You know, Hillary Clinton has been in our lives where we've known of her the whole time. Mm -hmm. You know, both conventions were so unconventional in that the Republican one was something we've never seen before, and the Democratic one was something we've never seen before. So much star power, performances, mm -hmm. you know, song, breaking into song. It's something very different. See, and, and I think it's really interesting because for the Republicans, they can't, um, if they are more, um, if they, if stars are more on the conservative side, they can't really go out and say something because that might be, that may be career ending, you know, because Hollywood is very, very, uh, liberal in that sense, and they pump a ton of money in. I mean, they had they had um, like famous directors directing just a two minute short. Shonda Rhimes. Shonda Rhimes. Shonda Rhimes yeah. is there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of the people that spoke. That video, yeah. Yeah. Eva Longoria, Meryl Streep. Yeah. I mean, these are women that are super impactful. And like and like, there, there's nothing, there's no, absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I just, it's unfortunate for the conservative people that they do have to, um, mm -hmm. that they do have to kind of hide in the shadows. I just want justice for both sides, you know, in a sense, yeah. just because, like, that's, that's so why, that's, yeah, exactly, you know, equal representation, you know, so that's just kind of. I think what I was most upset about in the Republican National Convention is how much fear-mongering is going on yeah, with this much. party right now. They're basically making America out to be a total dire situation. <laughs> Uh, and for the American public, and it's really not. It's not that they're, the issues that they're talking about are not really issues. It's not really the values that America stands for. These are this is the most the most radicalized Republican convention ever. I remember thinking that stuff that Mitt Romney said was crazy, you know, eight years ago, yeah. uh, and not so much now. I'm like, you long for Trump, the days of Romney. Totally. <laughs> yeah. I liked when Obama said America is already great. That part stood out to me. Yeah, personally, I think that um, the GOP is going to crumble eventually. It really is, especially in the way that how progressive America is turning into. And I think when it restructures, it's still going to have the the fiscal ideas of, of smaller government, but it's going to definitely open up way more socially. And that's why I don't think there won't there probably won't be another Republican president for the next 30 years or something like that. So that's just my own personal George thing. W. Bush mm -hmm. thinks so too. You know, exactly, and until they yeah. move, they have to move towards the center, mm -hmm. and then we'll be able to have two strong it's parties. It's important together. to note that uh, the Bushes were not at the convention or speaking at all. Yeah, Donald Trump. So, mm -hmm. but yeah. So moving on, how can a restaurant chain impact childhood hunger in the United States? Well, that's exactly what Cal State Fullerton graduate Anakari Corona answered to receive a Denny's Hungry for Education scholarship. Administered by the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, the scholarship was awarded to five student recipients across the country. Corona stated, quote, as a Latina who comes from a family of immigrants, I experience childhood hunger and know how detrimental it is and how it affects a child's development, end quote. Corona is working towards her master of social work degree and pre previously received a Bachelor of Science in Human Services, also at CSUF. She is the first in her family to graduate from college and the first to pursue a graduate degree. Once again, another successful Titan doing tremendous work in the community. Good job, Anakari. 80 Brazilian students are joining Cal State Fullerton students and faculty this summer in research projects ranging from engineering, kinesiology, computer science, and many more. The Student International Research Institution is a new program that invites undergraduate international students to CSUF during the summer to participate in research and is co-hosted by the Office of International Programs and Global Engagement and the College of Engineering and Computer Science. Benodi Tawari, the, pro the program director, stated, quote, it makes our students have a better understanding of other cultures, think in a, in a different way, and absolutely become more employable, end quote. This year, SRI program was founded in part by the 100,000 strong in the America's Innovation Fund, a public-private collaboration of the White House, U.S. Department of State, and Partners of the Americas. Tawari also stated, quote, This summer, our students and the Brazilian students are so cohesive. They work together, they're friends, and they're learning from each other very nicely. We hope these students will go back to Brazil and share what they've learned at the CSUF, end quote. 
David Bald Eagle, who many know from the film Dances with Wolves, has died at the age of 97. However, what many don't know is that in his long, remarkable life, he was a champion dancer, a touring musician, a rodeo cowboy, a tribal chief, a stunt double, and a war hero. He danced with Marilyn Monroe, he drove race cars, he parachuted into enemy gunfire at Normandy, he played professional baseball. He was a leader not just of his tribe, but of the United Native Nations. He was an advocate for Native people. When David enlisted in the Army, he joined as a paratrooper with the 82nd Airborne. Sergeant Bald Eagle's first combat jump was during the invasion of Anzio, Italy. Then he parachuted into Normandy, suffering severe injuries when he was accidentally dropped directly over German troops, an easy target for gunfire. The first medics to reach him left, for left him for dead, but some British commandos came along and found he still had a pulse. Bald Eagle survived and started a musical career as a drummer. Also, he started race car driving, tried skydiving, turned to the rodeo circuit, took up bareback bull riding, became a stunt double in the movies where he really made his name because shooting westerns requ required, quote, people who can actually ride horses, end quote. And Bald Eagle was a very talented rider. However, the westerns he was in re represented na native people as less than human. So Bald Eagle always tried to teach people about Native American history and life. Stephen Lewis Simpson, a director and friend of David, stated, quote, The funny thing is that normally when a 97-year-old passes away, you go, well, they had an incredible long life. You kind of think it's the end of it, and yet in a strange way with David, you just didn't feel that there was an end to him, end quote. Our condolences are with the friends and family of David Bald Eagle. While writer Tim Brooks began researching unusual alphabets for, quick, for gift carvings, he quickly discovered that fully a third of the world's 100 alphabets are endangered. He then began preserving ancient scripts by carving them into wood and has ex ex exhibited his beautiful carvings all over the world and currently are showcased right here in our library. Let's take a look. There are approximately 7,000 languages in the world, but there are only about 100 scripts, and perhaps a third of those are endangered. In 2007, Tim Brooks came to the realization that people of the world were losing important aspects of their culture, the language that they speak, and the knowledge how to write it. Due to the proliferation of the dominant languages, there has been a decrease in the use of indigenous languages from people all around the world, especially in script form. Tim Brooks's art displays the forgotten alphabets to raise awareness and incite the public to encourage children to learn to speak and write their native language. His works are a unique combination of calligraphy, poetry, and sculpture. His wooden carvings are displayed as artworks to people who do not read the language, but to those who do, they become a way to preserve their writing. Samaritan is Mesopotamian. Manchu is Mongolian. Tifinok is from the Sahara de Desert area, and Akitu is from Canada. Brooks and Mang Nyo, a Bangladeshi man who first hand witnessed the difficulty it is to become a successful person when one doesn't know how to write in their native language, has been working on a project that creates children's books in indigenous languages and scripts so as to teach children the importance of cultural diversity. The second annual California Teacher Summit was held at Cal State Fullerton on July 29th. We have live coverage of the event. Here are some of the highlights. Welcome and join 15,000 people across the state celebrating teachers on this very day at this very moment. It's our privilege to work with professionals such as yourselves through your hard work, dedication, and expertise, the future of our communities, the children who spend time in your classrooms and schools is shaped. But teaching is not and should not be solitary work. It's important that we know and that our children feel that, that we're winners. We are born winners. My students are asked to research a topic that they feel passionate about. And they have to answer the following guiding questions. Define the problem or situation. What is the root of the problem? How does it affect our community or world? Who are the professionals fighting to make this right? How can the public help? Mantra in my classroom. It comes from the house of Mango Street. They will not know I have gone away to come back. For the ones I left behind. For the ones who cannot out. 
I want to invite you. Let's make sure our students become the activists who come back for the ones who are left behind. Thank you. Students must engage in just as scientists and engineers do in their day-to-day -day work. Finally, we have a beautiful marriage of both content and process in the NGSS. Every performance expectation starts with an active phrase that denotes how students may engage with content and a broader theme that provides a context for exploration. Learning now must be rich and multifaceted. You said, if we could institute one change to make students more college ready, it should be to increase the amount and quality of writing students are expected to produce. Day of learning and sharing, we truly are better together. Thank you. Our very own Jasmine Arenas attended a charity event in Newport Beach, welcoming back the Los Angeles Rams. Let's take a look at the highlights. Rams are back and they're getting the straight to work supporting charity. Tonight, the charity is Give Cancer the Bird. Let's go inside Stag Bar and Kitchen where all the festivities and activities are taking place. Found out the Rams are coming back into town and we are really excited about it. Selling bracelets, we're uh, trying to make it a movement. We um, donate to many different organizations that benefit cancer uh, treatment, um, among many other things. And this is our first kickoff initial event. When we do events like this, we like to make sure that there's a charity involved so that it's not a self-serving event. It's a uh, giving back. We had a couple of liquor vendors donate a bunch of liquor so that we could sell 100% of the proceeds of all those drinks, go straight to the charity. We're selling raffle tickets. One of the many perks of this event, special guest appearances. They've done a great job in uh, promoting money to fight cancer. Everybody benefits by having an NFL franchise in their community. What inspired you to come out here? You know, I'm a, I'm a cancer survivor. I have prostate cancer, and I survived uh, prostate cancer. So whenever I get a chance to do any type of charity that benefits cancer recipients. For Titan TV, I'm Jasmine Arenas. Do students consider nutrition when reaching for a soda or snack? Pembuchu Rasnavinchak, a Cal State Fullerton assistant professor of health science, is leading several studies to better understand how food labeling affects college students' purchasing decisions. This stems from the FDA rolling out a new nutritional facts label to increase consumers' understanding of their food options. Most manufacturers have until July 2018 to comply. Four students are assisting with the research project, from developing questions to designing the online survey, and 500 CSUF undergrads will be invited to participate this fall. Rasma Vigitong states, quote, the FDA believes the current version of the nutritional facts label provides too much information for the average consumer and that most people only pay attention to a few items like serving size, calories per serving size, and some macronutrients. We plan to test how well college students understand both the current and new version of the FDA label as well as an alternative version, end quote. The new label features the total calories in larger font, updates the serving size calculation, displays added sugars, includes gram amounts for vitamin D and potassium, and removes calories from fat and amounts of vitamins A and C. As the study progresses, we'll continue to keep our viewers updated. Well, that's all the time we have on this edition of the report. Until next time, I'm Sayura Arias. I'm Evan Boydston. I'm Jessica Lucero. I'm Jeffrey Witten. And I'm Nicholas Garcia. Stay fresh, Boydston. <laughs>